So now we're way over on page 222. So on page 222, I've got to go back and draw something here because it makes much more sense. This is something that we've had on the board before. Remember in the lean theory system, we have the bank and we have you and you gave money, then you signed an IOU and you signed a mortgage. This was the lean theory. The other one, here you are, here the bank is, then there's that third party, the bank gives you money, you give the bank the IOU, IOU, and then you deed of trust into that third party, and this was called title theory, all right? Remember that? All right, so here's the key. In the lien theory, I fail to make my payment for 19 months. And the bank calls me up and they say, hey, Raymond, according to the contract called an IOU or the note or the financing vehicle or whatever you want to call it, you said you would make monthly payments to me. And I said, well, I don't think that's what that contract says. I think it said I get 19 months for free. And the bank says, uh, no, I, I'm pretty sure it said every month. And I say, well, prove it. So tell me who reads a contract and decides legally what it says. Practicing attorney. Attorney's a good answer, but Cameron, my attorney is going to say something different than your attorney. So a judge. A judge. <laughs> we have to go in front of a judge to read this contract. Therefore, in your book. We have what's called judicial foreclosure. We have to go in front of a judge to say, no, Raymond, this contract literally does say you would pay monthly. You are in violation of this contract. Therefore, you are now foreclosed on. We have to go in front of a judge because we are arguing, we being the bank and I, are arguing over what this contract says. And the only person that can read a contract definitively and give us an answer is the judge. So we go to court and have the foreclosure court or the judge tell us what that contract says. Therefore, we have what's called judicial foreclosure. Now watch this. Over here, if I miss a payment or two and the bank says, hey, you violated your note, and I'm like, well, I don't think so. And they say, you know what? We don't care because what you think is not important because you don't own the property. That third party trust is the owner of the property. So they literally just call the trust and go, hey, that guy's missed his payments, give us our property back. And that third party goes, okay, because it's their job. So they have what's called non-judicial foreclosure. We do not need to go in front of a judge and argue it because I, as the person that missed these payments, am not the owner of the property. The trust is the owner and the trust has a clause in it called the power of sale clause. 
So when I deeded the property into the trust through that deed of trust, one of the paragraphs said, in case the bank declares a foreclosure, we will exercise our right to sell the property and give the bank their money back. It's called the power of sale clause. So it's a non-judicial foreclosure. In some states, the lender acquires the property through what's called a strict foreclosure. This is where they just deed them the property back instantly and the bank gets the property. So understand in a non-judicial, the third party trustee sells the house and gives the money to the bank because the bank wants money. They don't want the house. The slight difference in a strict foreclosure is the bank does end up with the house. Now, there is a case where I go, you know, I haven't made a payment in 19 months and dude, you're right. I, I'm in wrong. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you the property back instead of going to court. I'm going to give you the property back, deed, instead of, in lieu of, going to court, foreclosure. In your book, it's called a deed in lieu of foreclosure. That's literally what the guy's saying. I'm going to give you the property back so we don't go to court. That's a deed in lieu of foreclosure. Remember, we only went to court to argue because I and the bank are arguing. If I literally said, I'm, you're right, I'm wrong. I know I'm not supposed to get 19 months, but here's what I want to do. I want to deed you the property back so we don't have to go to court and we can all just move on with our life and get going, all right? Is that foreclosure a negative mark then against that person, although they deeded it back to the bank? Used to be in the old days, there were people that believed the foreclosure was a 10 on a scale of one to 10, and a deed in lieu was like a seven mm -hmm. because you didn't force them to fight. But I'm here to tell you now, mortgage lenders in today's world, it's still a foreclosure. There, it's still a 10. The fact you surrendered it because you were behind on your payments still is seen as a foreclosure, all right? Now, I tell everybody in Indiana, a deed in lieu of foreclosure is kind of like a unicorn. Sounds great in theory, but never seen one in practice because I will tell you in Indiana, you guys may know, but you'll find out soon. We work one year in arrears in our taxes. Right now in 2020, we are just paying 2018's taxes that come due in 2019 because we're a year behind. So how do I give the property back to the bank? What method would I use? There's that <laughs> word again. We're going to sell it. Not to the bank. If I'm going to, before the foreclosure, I would want to sell it. That's what we talked about earlier. Now we're to the point of foreclosure, and I want to avoid foreclosure. I want to give it back to them. I would give it in the form of a quick claim deed back to the bank. Okay. All right. But now the bank gets what? All of my interests, no matter what they are. Okay. Well, in Indiana, I have a tax debt that I owe. So guess who gets the tax debt if I surrender the property back to the bank? The bank. The bank does. So that's why in Indiana, deed in lieu of foreclosure is very seldom ever accomplished. I personally have never seen one actually happen. There was a girl in one class who claimed that she did it. I've never seen it because 
typically you the bank will send you a letter and go, hey, let's talk, work out a deed and foreclosure. And then they you say yes, and then they run the title work on this house. And they find, oh, you're in Indiana, we can't do that. So they end up going to foreclosure anyway because they have to clear those liens, all right? So that's how you can avoid the court case. You don't necessarily avoid the foreclosure through this deed in lieu. Now, there's one other thing on page 224 I want to add in this section. It's called a deficiency. You know what? Let's not do that here. Trying to think what the better order is. Let's keep going in, in the order of the book and we'll come back to it. So now when the bank goes to the court and I go to court and the judge says, Raymond, you're wrong. Give them the money you promised because they activated the acceleration clause. And I literally go, um, uh, I, I don't have any money. And they go, oh, well, now you must give them the collateral that you promised if you weren't make the payments. This is how the bank gets my house. Because I surrender my collateral because I can't pay the loan. Thumbs up. Now, I told you a minute ago, the bank doesn't want the house, they want their money. So when the bank wins the court case, they grab their house under their arm, but before they go home with their house, they make one stop where? Where is the first stop the lender takes the house? It's called a sheriff sale. I right. have to say an auction or something. It's the sheriff sale, which is an auction. All right. Because in Indiana, that's the uh, the sheriff's by law, by statute, that's one of his requirements is to auction homes that are in foreclosure. Because the banks don't want the house, they want their money. So they go to the sheriff and go, here's our house, auction it and give me my money. And the bank or the sheriff has a sheriff sale and then takes the money and gives it to the bank and go, here you go. 